Tyler, let's talk about Fisker. Use it as the cautionary tale for what investors who are looking for the next great thing should be really careful about. It's another reminder of when sometimes going chasing the next something doesn't always work out as hoped. Sometimes instead of trying to win it big, the best path to investing success is avoiding losing. I'm Jason Hall. This is Investing Unscripted. We're going to talk about Fisker, how it got where it is, where things are exactly, and also maybe some other areas of the market that might be ap appealing to investors looking to create wealth in a safer way. This video is sponsored by The Motley Fool. If you're looking for even more great stock ideas, go to our link. You see it right there on the screen. It's fool.com forward slash unscripted. The Motley Fool is going to give you its 10 best stocks to buy right now. Check out that link again, fool.com forward slash unscripted. Tyler, I'm going to show you something sad and painful. Two cents a share. Of course, Fisker's stock has been halted. The New York Stock Exchange is delisting the stock, so it's not trading. This is a stock as recently as October was over $6 a share. This is as close to losing everything as a lot of investors get. Exactly what's happened and what's going to happen next. Henrik Fisker, actually a pretty well-known automotive designer. is He's, I think historically, he's worked with a lot of other companies, has been one of the more successful designers in the industry. Basically, Fisker tried to run his own business. And I think this was actually his second attempt at running a business. It because is. There was That's a, true. The, yep. There was a, a previous Fisker automotive that didn't quite work out either. But it, it was a an interesting attempt, I guess you could say. They didn't actually manufacture themselves. They were actually going to uh, contract out to a automotive supplier that was actually going to build the, the vehicle for them. And it was basically, they were responsible for the design, the engineering, the a lot of the, the back-end stuff, as well as the marketing. And that's an interesting idea. And there's certainly, Tyler, something to be compelling about it. Because if you think about an automotive startup, the hardest part and the most expensive part is building factories and acquiring tooling ahead of actually producing vehicles to generate cash flow and revenue. And that's one of the hardest barriers to entry to the automotive industry is exactly that. It's also one of the reasons that most automakers rely on third-party manufacturers to make most of their components. And then the automakers generally just assembling the vehicle. And Fisker's idea was, let's just take even that assembly part and we'll do all the design, we'll do the engineering, but then we'll have somebody else that already has a factory. They can acquire the tooling and then they can do the assembly uh, on our behalf. So it's a great idea. What's been the issue though? The biggest issue for them has mostly been a lack of sales, I guess would be the best way to put it, and getting cars into people's hands. One of the things that they had mentioned on their previous, their third quarter earnings call was basically they, I think they produced double the amount of cars than the, the ones that they had actually delivered to, to, to customers, despite the fact that there was customers demand for these vehicles. And so as a result, they've just had building inventory and inability to really convert that to cash and start to actually pay off some of that contract manufacturing that made it happen. It's been a confluence of a lot of different issues. It's hard to say specifically which one is the one that kind of put the nail in the coffin here, if you will. Basically, what ended up happening too is that decline in sales and kind of the inability to get vehicles into customers' hands, it, it spiraled out of control. And what we have here now is basically the, the company tried to sell itself to a major automotive manufacturer. There was word came out I think the, recently. the rumor, Tyler, the rumor is that I think it was Nissan. It was in negotiations with Nissan. What we do know is we got a press release a couple of days ago. The key of the press release here is that on March 22nd, that's, this is when they received notice that the, the partner they were no, negotiating with was walking away, right? Dominoes continued to fall from there because then the next press release, and these press releases came out on the same day, once word got out that Fisker really didn't have a clear financial path forward, the New York Stock Exchange formally notified Fisker that it was delisting the stock. And the reason that was happening is because the stock price had consistently stayed below the minimum threshold, I believe, is $1 a share for the New York Stock Exchange. But then it, it gets worse, as these things do, because as soon as it was delisted, there's some debt. 2026 notes, 2025 notes, it's convertible notes, that when the stock was delisted, it triggered a requirement to offer to repurchase those notes. Guess what? Fisker doesn't have enough resources to pay off those debt, to repurchase those debts. They've also, I believe they've announced that they're suspending manufacturing for a period of time. 
when you don't have resources to pay your contract manufacturer, that happens. They have, they do have some inventory. We've talked about that before. I'm going to share on the screen what they have done to try to generate some capital is they have substantially lower prices. The Fisker Ocean, they have just gutted the price to try to generate some sort of cash flow to meet some of their minimum obligations, Tyler. Yeah. And expected, right? If you're getting called on debt and you don't have anything other than your inventory and you need it to get paid right away, that's what's going to happen. How many people are going to buy a vehicle from an insolvent company is another question because then all of a sudden it's like, well, who's going to repair it? Who's going to service it? There's a lot of questions when it comes to that. The larger point, I think here, and the big investor lesson that we can take away from all of this is that there's you and I have been doing this for quite some time, and this is not the first time we've seen very hyped up, popular concepts or ideas dominate the conversation in the market. If you can remember, I think it was like right around 2013, 2014, there was a huge investor interest in 3D printing. There was a concept that mm -hmm. we were all going to have 3D printers in our house and never have to go buy anything ever again, because when we wanted something, we would just 3D print it in our own homes. It was it got wild for a while and yeah, it didn't happen. And here's the funny thing about that, Tyler. I think that's a good example because the reality is that there is a tremendous amount more 3D printing than is happening today than was happening a decade ago when that, I guess you could use the term bubble, when that mania was going on in industrial applications. There's some really cool things that are being done with advanced materials with using 3D printing, but it was not some nascent technology that changed the world that created massive wealth for investors, right? I think that's the key point. The other thing that to me is that this is so powerful about this. Everybody's been trying to find the next Tesla for the past three or four years. And to me, it's just such a reminder that what Tesla did, how hard it really was and how amazing it was for Tesla to become now one of the larger automakers in the world the best-selling vehicle in the world last year, not just EVs, right? One of the best-selling uh, car makers on the planet. The, what they've been able to accomplish is remarkable, and the degree of difficulty is so high. The last thing I think for me, before we talk about some investing ideas, Tyler, is I mentioned at the beginning, sometimes instead of trying to find the next big thing, to hit it big, to win, sometimes the better approach to creating wealth and investing is just avoiding the losses of all of the EV stocks that we've seen trying to find the next Tesla. I would love to hear from you. What is a stock right now that might be underappreciated that you think investors are missing the opportunity on that might be a, a good investment over the long term? I'm actually going to stick to the automotive here just so we stay on topic uh, a little bit. So we talked about how Fisker basically hired a manufacturer to do it for them. The manufacturer that, they, that was actually doing that work is a company called Magna International. And they're one of the largest and leading component manufacturers in the United States, in North America, and I believe the world. They have done some, they do overflow contract manufacturing for not just Fisker, but a, a wide variety of other manufacturers as well, who maybe they have a, a, a particular vehicle that they don't, they're expanding production of it, but they don't have enough in-house capacity to do it, nor is there enough demand that they need to build a whole new factory to make that happen, that's when they rely on somebody like Magna International to do their contract manufacturing. So this is one of those businesses that's behind the scenes in the automotive manufacturing industry that has not only is it a, a, a play on basically every trend within automotive in general, it's been one of the better wealth creators in the automotive industry relative to what historically has not been one of the better wealth generating industries over the long term. And today, it's a $15 billion company that price to earnings ratio is only 12. I know that historically, the automotive industry trades for a considerably lower valuation than the broader market because it is a cyclical business. But this is one of the few that has proven to be one of the better value creators over the long term. I'm going to stick with the same idea of maybe an unknown company that manufactures a product that's really important for a bigger trend. But instead of talking about electric vehicles, I'm going to move more industrial and move into energy. And I want to talk about chart industries, which manufactures the equipment that is used to take things like natural gas, oxygen, and hydrogen, and to supercool those materials so that then they can be transported in more effective manners, um, better energy density, 
Uh, we have tons of natural gas in North America and other parts of the world. Liquefying it so you can get it on container ships and get it to demand markets is really important. Chart has been around for over a century. And what they've proven over the past 15 years or so is they're actually really good at doing roll-ups. They're really good at finding acquisitions that fit within what they're good at, but also expand their market in some way, create value for their customers, bolt on those small acquisitions and then integrate them into their business while also growing organically. So I think Chart Industries, the ticker GTLS, is also one that is really worth a close look right now. 